Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. I've got a Bobby Dazzler for you today. Check it out, the Hewlett Packard 85. What a classic. From uh, 1979 slash 1980, a basically, well, a personal computer, I guess, but it's more technically uh, correct to call it a scientific computer, really, because um, that's what it was marketed towards the professional uh, you know, engineering, scientific community, and things like that. CRT display, 256 by 192. None of this colour rubbish, monochrome all the way. And uh, 8K of RAM, standard built in, but that can be expanded up to 64K via expansion packs in the back. A fantastic high-speed uh, tape drive. N none of this standard cassette rubbish. No sorry, Bob. This has got real high-speed uh, professional tape in it. It's got a thermal printer in it. And this one is fully working. I scored this baby on eBay. It's beautiful. So click here if you want to see a video um, powering this thing up and having a play around with it. But you know what we say here on the EV blog. Don't turn it on. Take it apart. You can see the memory packs. I've got a ROM uh, drawer which has the ROM cartridges actually in there. I've got a 16k memory expansion module on this puppy It's got four expansion slots. You can see it's like a uh, clamshell type design So I assume we flip it over there'll be some screws and this whole top lid should just lift off and we'll see Everything inside it should have really good access. Let's go. There's the serial number for those playing along at home now, of course, this will be all through-hole technology, none of that surface mount rubbish, and uh, this uses all custom, supposedly, that's not a screw, all custom HP parts in it. HP silicon, apart from the memory, um, of course, HP didn't make their own memory as far as I'm aware. No, that's not a, that's not a screw. And... Uh, so yeah, it uses its own HP processor, so no, it's not a, you know, a Z80 or a 6502 or anything back in, like uh, most PCs had back in the day. It was um, HP's own processor. They ro rolled their own stuff, just like they did for all their HP calculators and things like that. Runs at a whopping 600 and something kilohertz. <laughs> Does it, it's not even rocking a megahertz, this thing, but it doesn't have... It, really didn't have to. It, it really works quite a treat and you didn't have to care about the speed of things. The, just the fact that you could do scientific computing and this has uh, special functions for graphing and scaling graphs and doing axes and labels and things like that. It was a real powerful scientific tool and you didn't really care about the speed of the thing. You cared about, you know, having professional uh, tape that you could store to. You cared about having all the uh, scientific and mathematical uh, functions and graphing capability and that you could get the print out and you could expand it and control things and everything else. So that was more important than just the raw operational speed of this thing. So anyway, let's, let me take the cartridge out and this hopefully should just lift off. Okay, it looks like the trick here is this ejector bar has to come out. Ta-da! Look at that. Beautiful. Here we go. Let's try and lift the case off now. Fantastic. Oh, we're in like Flynn. Look at that. Beautiful. Oh, nice and clean too. Love it. Wow, check out the nickel screening on this thing. And look, has somebody signed it? Is that, I don't know. Is that the person who assembled it? Person who checked it? I'm not sure, but good on ya. Beautiful. Oh, it's even got a date. Look, 12-20-79. There you go. Wow, 1979 vintage. And there's no shortage of people actually signing this too. Whether or not uh, it was some signature series that was important for some reason or uh, they're the production operators who signed it off as checked. And by the way, I found in the manual how to decode the serial number here. The first two digits are the year after 1960. So that's uh, 20. So we're talking, this one was actually manufactured 1980. And the 23rd week, 1980. Check it out. We have a loose washer. What it's doing there, I've got no idea. But it's magnetic. It's sticking there. That is magnetic. <laughs> Go figure. 
I'm really impressed by how clean this thing is. I mean, there's no dust in the bottom of it. And look at the quality of the uh, cabling in there, the heat shrink down on the brightness pot down the bottom on the uh, back panel. But yeah, that is really quite nice. That's a high voltage section. It hasn't attracted any dust or anything. CRT looks as good as the day it was built. Fantastic. There's the money shot for all you Sprug capacitor fanboys. What I find really fascinating though is all this, look, welded um, aluminium uh, bar bracket thing, for want of a better term, holding the CRT in here. It goes all the way down to the bottom. It's anchored in two points there. It's got rods going like, you know, it's folded back on itself and this is like welded onto there. And then it forms an entire frame, bracing frame, which then comes up over here, down across. We've got a uh, bracing bar across there, which that's welded on, and it goes over and holds the entire CRT rigidly in place. It's very nice. Then we've got all the mains input wiring down here. You can see it, and it's all uh, nicely crimped and uh, heat shrunk. Very nice. I mean, you know, it's, it's par for the course back in the day, but that's all uh, professionally done. Linear transformer, none of that switch mode rubbish. And then we've got ourselves the main uh, drive motor for the head. This goes over here for the uh, print head. You can see the, see the band there that drives the head across like that. And then we've got our paper advance uh, motor down in here. North American Phillips Controls Corp. Wow, look at that. Somebody signed that as well. Obviously, um, some sort of tested mark. 12 watt motor. Thank you very much. No wonder this, uh, this thing was, you know, pretty high performance in terms of its uh, tape drive and also its uh, printing. There's the bottom of the printhead stepper motor. Molon Motor and Coil Corp. Are they still going? Anyway, that looks like a beaut. So this board down in here is going to be our main power supply board and also it's uh, generating, well it's got the control, check it out, there's the uh, uh, darkness control for the print head that uh, controls, you know, light or dark and that actually comes up through the uh, flap in the top cover of the thing. So that's built in to the back of the board. Very interestingly, if you have a look down in here, there's the mains earth point down there. It's got a uh, shake-proof washer and uh, nut and everything else. It's all properly crimped. But this is actually a huge, gigantic flat flex ribbon. Look, it's just all one big copper strap, like one inch wide. And that actually goes over to the um, main board over here. Believe it or not, it's hard to see, but it's like right down in the bottom of the board down in there attached right down in there. Absolutely fascinating why they've gone with like a big one inch wide uh, f flex ribbon there instead of just wire like they've used everywhere else. I love this. Look, this is our ribbon, okay, running from our uh, expansion board on the back, the four expansion connectors, all going over like that. And look, it's just like tacked behind the high voltage back drive of the CRT there. Nice. But I obviously they didn't care. It's fine. Wires are insulated. No worries. And we've got our high voltage CRT driver board. It all looks pretty standard fare. Um, and yeah, we've got a bit of a discrete logic socketed ICs over there. So that's rather interesting. They've uh, Design that for surfacing and and un oh looks like we've got a jumper link some sort of uh, selection thing there in a uh, dual wipe um, eight pin IC socket. Hmm. But there's some more interesting stuff under there. This has got to be the uh, CRT driver chip. You can see big forty pin dip. We've got a couple of uh, split pins here and here holding on to that's there's a brackets on the board that then um, hold into that frame so if you unclip those this board should kind of fall out at least partially and check this out take a couple of screws off here there's some little pivot arms and the keyboard well it doesn't come all the way but pretty close very nice designed for servicing look at that we can now access the board oh i can see all the asic -y goodness. Oh, hang on. Yeah. 
and they've even got slots under the bottom here that you can access and unclip the keyboard from. And I know what you're all here to see. Show us the main board. Ta-da! Look at that. What a Bobby Dazzler. All custom HP A6, every one of them, except the off-the-shelf memory, which is Intel. Now, if we have a look at the main processor board on the left-hand side here, we'll find our main CPU. So we'll zoom into this section here, and here's an overlay from the uh, service manual, exactly what chips we've got here. The one up the top, of course, is the I.O. buffer, and that's a dead giveaway because it's right next to the uh, ribbon cable, which goes off to the expansion header connector on the back, and below that is the rather... Well, unimpressive looking uh, CPU. It's a, s a smaller package. What is it? A 28 pin dip there. And uh, uh, the interesting thing to note about this is that there's basically no glue logic in this thing because they did custom ASICs here. So the CPU included any necessary glue logic or things like that. So you won't find any support chips on here. You won't find some system glue PAL or GAL or, you know, CPLD or or something or another, you know, glue ASIC chip. They actually built them into the architecture of the other chips themselves. And the one down the bottom there, dead giveaway because it goes to the ribbon cable which goes off to the keyboard. That's the keyboard controller. And uh, then you can see the uh, power pinouts there on the ribbon cable coming in from the power supply. And you can also see the signals going off to the uh, display. So the display, like there's not even a display controller thing on this board. The processor hooks up directly to the CRT controller, which is over on the CRT board. And now if we have a look at the right hand side here, we can have a look at our ROM and our RAM and that's all there is. And like I said before, there is no glue logic here. So we've got, like you won't find a single uh, address decoder or anything like that as you would have got in, you know, an IBM PC of the uh, time or, you know, some other uh, PC architecture because HP did all their own custom ASIC, so they didn't need any of that rubbish. So anyway, we've got ourselves uh, four ROMs here, and once again, these aren't in your traditional plastic uh, dip packages. These are in the ceramic uh, gold, welded gold uh, capped uh, ROMs, like they made all these ASICs out of. So that's really interesting to see that they didn't use like traditional EPROMs here of the day, you know, with the UV window and everything else, and then put the sticker over them or whatever, or even uh, do just a cheaper plastic dip ROM, but um, hey, this is obviously a mask ROM uh, ASIC, HP had all the tools and all the technology too, and all the talent, we have the tools, we have the talent, it's Miller time, anyway, they had all of the uh, capability to do all these ASICs in-house, so they just did. Let's just put the ROMs in the same package as everything else. Must have cost a fortune. Anyway, right next to that on the uh, left-hand side, they do actually have a memory controller. What that memory controller uh, does, I don't particularly know. It just controls the mapping of the main memory, in this case, uh, 16K, and that is... And the interesting thing to note here is that all of these are socketed. So for ease of servicing, and the uh, if you read the service manual, it uh, shows you, you know, the troubleshooting guide. If you get this error, you know, it's this chip at fault, because, like, there's nothing else that can go wrong. You know, like, it must be this chip. Just change that one, and things like that. So, you know, really easy to uh, troubleshoot these things when everything's socketed beauty. And check out the tape there that goes straight up to the cassette and the printer there. Um, yeah, there's no interface at all. Just drives the lines. No worries whatsoever. And the CPU doesn't just have one clock. No sorry, Bob. Look, a four-phase clock. No worries. Um, one thing you don't see on here, though, is a crystal oscillator. So maybe it's got like an internal RC oscillator. And for all you switch aficionados, here you go. Wow, look at that. We've got four wipes on each one. No worries whatsoever. I don't know who actually made those keys, but yeah, and they feel really good too. But that's great contact. It's huge. And the great thing is everything's in sockets, all designed to be serviced. Beautiful. Speaking of which, you could actually get a troubleshooting uh, ROM for this thing. Like you plug it in and uh, you you know, can like exercise everything through the test modes and stuff like that. I just hope you're enjoying the pan in porn there. I'm just doing that by hand. Beautiful. We've got one lonesome tranny down there. Oh, 
but that um, looks like it's going into the CRT um, driver board. So, yeah, like they needed one extra transistor and, well, bung it in. Why not? The good thing is, is that you can actually take out two screws at the front here and this whole frame is basically going to lift out, but uh, you have to be careful getting these ribbons out. I've already uh, maybe, uh, look, a bit of force, I'll show you. And what happens, here you go, they've been stuck in there a bit too long, and uh, hopefully I haven't uh, damaged anything there. It should go back in, but yeah, you've got to be real careful taking those out. So I'm going to lift that out. Have they left enough room to do it? Oh, you betcha they have. Look at that. That is beautiful system design that you can get in there and access and repair everything. Fantastic. And that is the complete module. That's just beautiful. It comes out. The only thing attaching is the brightness uh, control. Obviously, you can see all the, the digital interface coming from the uh, processor through those two ribbon cables. We've got ourselves a graphics uh, processor in there. I'm not sure what the... Uh, deal is but that'd be like the well graphics processor display driver crt uh display driver they've got a couple of other miscellaneous ones four socketed chips we'll take a might have a closer look at those but uh there you go there's our light output transformer and the crt and that's just beautiful bit of engineering all in one modular frame like that fantastic It'd be easy to test at the production stage easy to replace the whole thing the board comes out on those clips as I showed you, and it, ah, oh, it's, this is not by accident. This is just by design. Fantastic. And those other four socketed chips look like uh, custom national parts. You can see the old uh, national semiconductor symbol there, and they've got like a HP part number, I believe, so you'd be able to look those up. And we can get a look at the main uh, power supply board here. It looks like they do some uh, switching goodness. We've got ourselves a couple of uh, switching transformers here. We've got a uh, power transistor on a heatsink. The rest are just uh, using PCB as a little bit of heatsink there, two end on diodes. And I assume that this is the driver for the uh, printer up here. And then uh, power just goes through this ribbon cable down here, down to these. These connectors here, they must go off to uh, drive the uh, various motors and uh, things for the printer. But yeah, all your power's running through the ribbon. The logic circuitry probably doesn't take a huge amount of power. And if you're wondering about the interface board, well, there's just nothing on it. Just a couple of uh, custom HP parts there, whatever they are. They could be just off the shelf uh, rebranded with HP part number or whatnot, but no, that's it. It basically goes down right to the connectors. I can show you that. There we go. Nothing else. As for the printer head, you can see the white ceramic head there. The paper passes between that and that uh, uh, back in, whatever that back in uh, happens to be, some sort of heat resistant thing. I don't know, but... Uh, yeah, I'm moving that manually with my hand, moving the stepper motor. Now the belt, I'm not sure uh, what the, it, like, it doesn't feel, like it feels kind of rubbery, but it's not like the black rubber that you're more used to. So there's been a bit of wear on that, but it still works just fine. And you guessed it, this entire printer, tape, assembly, and power supply. Uh, is going to just lift out like that. Ha <laughs> ha! Beautiful! And very nice touch. Rubber anti-vibration mounts on here. And they've also got those on the printer mechanism as well, just on here. So to separate the printer uh, part from the rest of the chassis. And then the chassis itself then isolated from the case down here. Oh no! Exposed mains wiring. Look at that. Oh, that's a bit how you're doing. And you can actually see the rubber mounts in there and you'll note the compliant nature of that just the tape drive mechanism on its own from the printer and now you can probably see why that copper strap made sense because you had to undo one screw holding that down and uh yeah it just comes out with the whole mechanism it's all formed in place um so yeah 
there's method to that madness. And the whole tape drive mechanism just came off with those two screws there with the rubber mounts. And there's our head. There's our little, uh, little drive there. And that's, you know, it's fairly simplistic. If we have a look at it, there's, uh, we'll see our controller down in there, but there's our motor. They've just got that wired straight over to the board. It's kind of neat. And if you have a peek in here, you can see our drive controller. There it is down in there. I probably won't take it apart much further, but there's not a huge amount of stuff on that, really, but there doesn't need to be. So this roller mechanism is really good, because unlike a cassette tape, um, there is no drive on the individual, look, on the bottom of this, like in the individual cassette tape, to just drive the spool there and there. What they've got is that, you can see the little spindle, in there and that's what drives the tape and then the tape whoop there it is there it's on the bottom half and then the spindles on the top half so there it is there's our tape so when that slides oh well, there we go look it just flo <laughs> flipped open look at that beautiful that just goes in like that and then doesn't push in oh okay there's something that's not engaging properly there but anyway it would go in and the tape will uh, go across the tape head of course and then the little uh, capstan wheel, or whatever you call it, um, just drives that and drives the tape. Beautiful. There you go, you might be able to see the tape just pushed over the head like that. And if we eject it up and push down. Yeah, while I'm here, might as well give the head a little wipe. Some isopropyl alcohol. Yeah, not much, gr not much crud on there. Often you use a cotton bud for this. There we go. Oh yeah, look at that. Clean as a whistle. And there's really nothing else inside the printer that we uh, haven't seen before. Just uh, this mode. Oh, there we go. A little bit of crud. A little bit of crud. But that's about all we had in this thing. Apart from that, it's very... It's a maybe a little bit of dust, but geez, pretty darn clean. Um, we have motor here uh, just to drive the uh, roller, and which then goes up there and drives that. Um, and then we have our stepper motor here, which you saw before, which then just uh, drives our ceramic head across there, which then heats up, and it's a thermal printer, of course, and we've got thermal sensitive paper. But there's no extra uh, drive circuitry. It's all controlled from here. Here's the ribbon going out. That goes straight into the uh, printer head there. Oh, ULN uh, 2068. There you go. Um, transistor driver array of some description. So I hope you enjoyed that teardown of this classic HP 85. Not personal computer. I prefer to call it technical, scientific computer, engineering computer, something like that. Anyway, but... It is basically a computer from 1979 slash 80, like 36 years old. Unbelievable. And they would have designed this in 78, 79, and it's just a beautiful design. They could have made it. They could have made it significantly uh, smaller. I mean, you know, it's not lightweight. It's not small. Um, it was marketed as portable, but back then there was nothing else available that was portable. So... Hey, you got what you got, but yeah, you know, this is classic like HP uh, design and construction and things like that. So it would have been nice to see something uh, smaller back in the day, but uh, well, this was still a groundbreaking machine and very, very popular. Hands up if you have one of these. Anyway, if you want to see me have a play around with it, then click here. Catch you next time incredibly powerful and you can do this to label axes and do all sorts of stuff here we're just going to label our function so here we go let's run it and it's going to take some time because remember this only works at uh, just over 600 kilohertz but no one cared back in the day but anyway here's our axes it's automatically uh, plotted all the um the little tick marks and everything and you can probably see what this one's going to do but the interesting part here is is that